Welcome back everyone to the live Cube coverage here in Las Vegas for SAS Innovate 2024. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube, with my co-host Dave Vellante, heads up Cube Research, also co-founder, co CEO with me, founder of the Cube. Brian Harris is here, CTO of SAS, multiple times. Second time on this event, we're coming back to go do a deeper dive on some of the tech and, and really what's driving the AI is the technology, but also the business model, workflows and data. And the three things we talked about last today was Performance, productivity, productivity, performance, and trust. trust. Yes. Great to see you. Good to see you, John. Good to see you, David. Always so, a pleasure. Hey, Brian. So, for the folks that are watching, might not have seen yesterday. You did the hot wings. What was it called? Hot ones. Hot <laughs> ones. Yeah. Where you go down. Sean Evans, and uh, you know, start from one wing to ten with a progressive heat going on. It was insane. One of the greatest experiences of my in my life. Amazing. <laughs> they showed the replay today oh, at the keynote. Yeah. You were dripping sweat, uh, yeah, it was I, I awesome. I looked like a tomato, I was so hot up there. <laughs> Out of body experience. Under duress, under <laughs> duress. So good. As I said, a lot of hot takes going on there, <laughs> uh, here in theCUBE. <laughs> oh, so we want to get into it, so I want to get into the, the, uh, the AI impact, we're going to go on the hood a little bit, but we want to talk about performance. Yeah. So the big theme with AI is you need more horsepower. Yep. I mean, I'm generalizing, AI, AI has XPUs, which is GPUs, TPUs, whatever you want to call it, and quantum's in the mix there. Yes. And you brought up in your keynote, and so you're starting to hear quantum in the same conversations now when you talk about these advanced AI demos and presentations because there's a performance angle there. Yeah, absolutely. What do you mean by quantum when you bring it up on the keynote and with all the goodness you guys are announcing, a lot of accomplishments, a lot of tech, customers with their AI stacks, why quantum? Well, I think that when we look at the, you know, because obviously generative AI is getting a lot of the headlines these days, but it, it, it really doesn't have a strong story in the quantitative space, it's really around reasoning of facts and, and, you know, and obviously they can do things with multimedia, we get that, but when you talk about dealing with numbers, it's actually very, very weak, right? And so, you got to start asking yourself, well, where are we going to start seeing acceleration on quantitative reasoning? It's really what I would look at it, right? And so, mm. when you start looking at that, obviously quantum, because of its architecture and ability to have the superposition, allows you to kind of have multiple states at once, which means you can do some really incredible, almost futuristic things. So one of the big problems of quant, uh, that we see is you got to find the right problem with quantum first, not for every problem. I mean, GPUs exist because they're great at doing linear algebra and, and, and multi-threaded linear algebra for deep learning. But there are optimization problems that are, require combinatorial trial and error type scenarios. And these are some of the hardest problems in the world and they're very impactful for four industries. Life sciences, banking, right, in the government space, um, as well as, you, know, the, uh, you think about, like I mentioned, life science, but pharmaceutical industry, um, insurance. Mm. And so, if you can find ways to compute these, these really, really co hard combinational, combinatorial problems faster, you can really drive the cost of compute down and solve problems that were unsolvable before. The, the, the basic example is this traveling salesperson problem, right? Which is like, for instance, you got a salesperson's in a city, right, center, they have to visit a bunch of cities, right, and only visit one of those cities once and get back to home. And they got to do that in a way that minimizes, minimizes distance. And there's no algorithm to do this. You just have to try them all out, evaluate the distance, and then pick the right one. Well, in real world problems, that becomes exponentially uh, complicated. And so quantum allows us to search that entire space of combinations and get to the right solutions faster. I think you said, I think it was you in your keynote yesterday. Yeah. It was a great keynote. You said within a year and a half, two years, yeah. Your quantum is going to have its gen AI moment. That's correct, I, I believe it. Um, the market is showing a lot of progression on it. So uh, I think it's like uh, $35 billion as uh, the market size right now, but it's, it's projected to go to a trillion dollars by 2030. So you got to imagine what's happening in the next you know, six years, the, the leaps we're going to make in this. And one of the big things that's happening in quantum is this idea of, well, qubits, and this is very analogous to what was going on with traditional computing. You know, we had 8-bit computers, 16-bit computers, 32-bit computers, and 64-bit computing. Yeah. So scalability of arithmetic is the big issue with, with, uh, with quantum right now. So as we go through uh, the qubits, scaling up on that, we'll be able to scale into more um, sophisticated problems uh, in the market. And I think that when you look at what the demand of complexity of problems that are in the financial world, you know, the hyper-connectivity of all these, you know, uh, financial systems right now is creating combinatorial problems that need to be explored differently, and quantum can help solve these things. So, I mean, I, I really hadn't paid much attention to quantum until recently, because it looks like it's finally yeah. starting to it's heating up. get real. And there's a lot of trade-offs, and a lot of different techniques. 
you could scale, but then the qubits aren't stable, yep. or you can get the qubits stable, but it's really slow, which defeats the purpose of quantum. Uh, from, from a technology standpoint, it's, it's, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like we're solving those problems. Do you have sort of line on site on maybe which of those techniques, or have you sort of yeah. chosen a path that well, you think two, works for your industry? There's two approaches that uh, quantum computers are approaching. And again, we're not in the business of building right. them, we're in there just to leverage them, but right. there's quantum annealing, which is, and these strategies are really about, quantum annealing allows to um, maintain state of a one or a zero, or in the case of uh, quantum, you can have a kind of idea of a superposition where you can actually be in two different states at once, which right. is why it, it's has amazing. incredible power. It's like mind bending. Yes, <laughs> and so um, when you think of that though, um, you know, like the other one is quantum gates, which is where they're trying to mimic the traditional semi, you know, semiconductor like in transistor. And so those are the two kind of big areas where people are pushing and research on of those. And, and it, those different quantum computers have different problems they're good at solving. I think there's, the, there's a pursuit right now of quantum gates that it, we could just, you know, kind of approach traditional problems one for one because it looks like a, what a semiconductor would do or transistors and things like that. Whereas quantum annealing I think is actually really stable right now in many areas of optimization problems, which I said is there is no algorithmic efficiency for that. So just one more follow up. When you talked about the 8, 16, 64, yeah. when we went to 64, you had to make some application changes to take advantage yeah, of it. Yeah, that, and that's yes. what you got to do with quantum, right? So you're it's, in the process of doing that? It's less so actually, so it's more around, I mean, yes, there's going to be part of that, but mm -hmm. a lot of these, when we leverage them, we're just sending them off as APIs to these things, and that's all kind of hidden behind the scenes, right? It's like, it's just a matter of scale of how much can it process at one time <clears throat> uh, based on, and then what's the efficiency of doing that? So. Uh, but we, we see that's just a natural progression in that industry. That will be solved, and when it's solved, SaaS wants to be ready to be leveraging these things. And what we're doing is, we're putting them in this like hybrid architecture of mm -hmm. traditional computing and quantum. And I would say this, <clears throat> you know, GPUs uh, didn't take over the CPU. They're just a specialized class of P P XPU, as you yeah. called it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think quantum's going to have its space, right? So when you're talking about GPUs, it's great for linear algebra and, and you know, matrix multiplication, and quantum's going to be great at search space optimization for how do I discover yeah. solutions in a very complicated problem. Now, that will be presented as compute in the cloud, right? Or as a service to a quantum computing company. And you're just going to leverage that service into your existing data and AI lifecycle and, and leverage incredible outcomes with it. I have to ask you, uh, you mentioned that you're not building quantum, but you're leveraging it, yeah. you mentioned it again. How are you leveraging it specifically? Is it in research stage right now, or is it you got some, you're moving the needle on pro <clears throat> product integration? Talk about what you're doing with that from a leverage standpoint, where you, where you see it leveraged, being levered for, for the benefit of the customers, and then what is the customer benefit? Yeah. The, if you look at, like I said, the, the, I mentioned that traveling salesperson problem, right, where you have to try all the combinations. If you were to run that in traditional cloud computing, you could, it could take you days, maybe months, to mm -hmm. run those, uh, those trial and error scenarios and then finally get a best solution. And <clears throat> that is expensive, especially in the cloud. What Quantum will give you the ability is instantaneously search that entire space because of its unique mm -hmm. characteristics and qualities and then find the best solutions that can be put back into traditional computing. And then it's like, almost like uh, shortcuts to good enough answers yeah. that can be put back into uh, traditional computing, which means all that cloud spend collapses to a much shorter amount of time. So you see it leveraging customers where they, get, <coughs> they have use cases where unattainable outcomes or ideas or un unknown well, thoughts about what, how they well, can leverage their like data. Like uh, drug discovery, I mean there's a lot of things like molecular compounds, there's chemistry, right? Uh, understanding the physics and the interactions of molecules at the lowest yeah. level is a very complicated task, mm -hmm. exhaustive com computationally. And you can imagine what, you know, every drug company out there, pharmaceutical company, wants to build a killer pipeline so they can get ahead of the FDA submissions and then, and that, that's one of the key areas that Quantum give a huge help okay, in. So I'm going to play the skeptic, okay? Okay, sure. Brian, hey, I hear you in all this. You know, Quantum is a science project. Yeah. I don't know what they're smoking in those labs, entanglements, qubits, whatever. HPC and AI are going to get to solve this problem. High performance computing is already there. They can do molecule stuff. On cloud, they, they're <coughs> slow, but HPC, and AI, GPU clouds, they're the rage. What, I mean, it, it, is, it, is that just kind of just the longer mean, distance? How, how do I, you think, I think you got to, <laughs> I think I appreciate that perspective and I, I think that's, you got to be careful with the hammer and nail scenario. Right? Yeah. If someone's making GPUs, every problem's going to look like a GPU should solve it, right? <laughs> if someone's making CPUs, everyone looks like a CPU. I think something that SAS 
does well is that we're looking at all the technology market and figure out what's the right use of that of technology for the problem. And that's why, that's the area of research we're doing. We're doing things like, what are the classifications of problems? What are the industries this is going to have an impact in? It just so happens, it coincides with our top four strategic interest, industries, banking, insurance, life sciences, and government, right? There's a lot there. Security, big deal, right? The whole SHOP-256, right? Everyone's worried about Bitcoin being un cracked open because quantum can basically you know, try all the ways to go and identify a key, a private key, and then unlock you know, wallets. So, there needs to be a lot of research here. So where, to answer your question, it's not just research for us. We are actually looking and working yeah. with customers who want yeah. to solve problems. Yeah. And we're exploring so You've identified use cases specifically, yes. like the crypto hacking, yeah. or, or cracking the wallet, as yeah. a l realistic possibility. It, yeah, I mean, it, this, is, this is a known concern. That's why there's now quantum proof uh, encryption out there, because this right. is emerging at a point where yeah. people are concerned about this. So, I think for us, it's, it's, we are a company that always wants to deliver results, not hype. We want to we cut through the hype and look at how we can apply our technology in ways that is you know, groundbreaking but pragmatic for businesses. So what yeah. we're doing is when, you, when we interact with quantum computers, we bring it back into our SASVI ecosystem and then they get all the governance and explainability and transparency they would get it. It's no different if we were to leverage a GPU for a deep learning model in our model studio. Yeah. So it's, it's us, we see it as normalizing the way we integrate it into our stack, and then the customer benefits from that, and they don't have to change their workflow with our software. And so, I mean, quantum computers, they're huge. They're like mm. bigger than that, <laughs> that right, right? And they're yeah. all liquid cooled, and then yeah. <clears throat> they're yeah. loud. High capital, high, high capex. <laughs> right, know, so investment. where are these things going to live? Uh, obviously all the cloud guys are doing it. You know, yeah. Satya showed yeah, it, we, at, at Ignite, IBM's yeah. doing it, et cetera. So they're going to be in the cloud. But in, you see all these specialized GPU clouds yeah, popping up all over the about, place, yeah. which is kind of interesting. You know, some people are doing their, their AI on-prem. Where are these things going to live? I think uh, with quantum computing, I mean, it's clear that I think it's going to take the same path as GPUs. So like, just like, let's say uh, um, NVIDIA is a provider to the cloud providers, right? Mm -hmm. um, you've got um, Super, Super Micro, right? These are all supply chains to the cloud providers. Right. I think you're going to see the same thing. I think you're going to see the emerging quantum computing uh, companies become just supply chains to the other cloud providers, and then they will present those things, right? The cloud providers will present that as, you know, uh, scale up, scale up, down, compute for your environment. That's why I said, um, really, we, we expect quantum, right? Our ability to leverage quantum yeah. will be really the GPU for optimization problems in that, back to yeah. your original question, when we have problems that make sense for quantum, we're going to leverage that to accelerate our compute, just like a GPU does. Yeah. And some of your customers might build their own quantum I doubt that. data centers, or no? I don't think like so. Like even the government? I think, I think well the government's probably, yeah. government could get right. there, but I think that, um, I don't yeah, think Yeah, the banks that, aren't going to do yeah, that, right? Yeah, I that think that's sense. just, there's too much capital. Right. Yeah. It's not core to their business, and I think that, <clears> honestly, there's so much, uh, there is so much still uh, progression needs to happen on that space that yeah. you got to be focused and on it, that. It, it, again, you guys have been very loud and clear about use cases here. Yeah. Pragmatic, but also yeah. high impact well, performance. Uh, and real quick too on this, like we're, we are a, you know, we are a numbers company. So if there's any company in the world that should be an expert in this, we should be. Because we have been, from the beginning, a statistics company, now an AI company, but so all of that is fun, foundational to all of that is yeah. our ability to do quantitative reasoning and quantitative analysis. Yeah. So quantum is just an extension of us <laughs> doing that better yeah. and yeah. faster. So, so we, we shouldn't think that quantum computers are going to replace traditional computers, or should we? No. Just like, now Jensen would say that GPU is going to replace, every, every workload is going to be accelerated, so there's really no need for, he implies there's no need for traditional you know, CPUs, but we, we know well, he's going to be. That's the hammer and nail. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. We know there's going to be a lot of diversity out there, but, yeah. we, but, but, but help us understand that. Yeah. Help the audience understand that we're not talking about a wholesale replacement of traditional no. computing, no. Von, von Neumann architectures. No, right, I mean, the, or G, are we? the, the GPU yeah. came about because we had to offload graphics off of the CPU. Yeah, right. right? And so, once we could do that, yeah. then we realized the same math that's in GPUs can be applied for AI. Right, for, for gaming, right, can be done for AI. And, and crypto mining. And yeah, crypto right. mining, right? <laughs> and so I think you're just going to have the same thing here. Just you're, it's not, I think the difference with quantum is because it's so, so big and so nebulous in a sense, yeah. that people don't feel it as finite as like say yeah. a GPU is. Like you put a, we can all put a GPU card in our computer, yeah. but quantum is just, see that quantum computer as just another GPU 
in your office. I mean, SAS, your model is just I'll leverage whatever compute uh, XPUs I can yeah. get for as much horsepower yeah. for the use case that it needs. In some cases, you need monster in, in quantum, and yeah. HPC with AI could work too. By the way, Dave, HP, HPC uh, and AI over the past two years, uh, we've been going to supercomputing for the past couple years with theCUBE. I mean, that's the show that's been around since I graduated college in 1988. They haven't moved the needle, it's like inch by inch, high proportion yeah. piece, this niche thing. They're doing stuff high performance now, like wing construction for Boeing, yeah. that, that takes literally minutes now. Yeah. It used to take hours and hours of compute. So there's advancements on HPC, but that's not quantum. No. Right, that, that's a huge difference between HPC. Yeah, well, in fact, uh, Via, for SAS Via, inside about SAS Via is something called the, the Cloud Analytics Service, which is our in-memory analytic engine. And some, you know, we can actually run a multi-node, uh, very large scale, and we have one of the top manu uh, semiconductor companies in the world runs a whole automated model tournament um, using Via's in-memory compute that behaves very much like HPC. It's holding data in memory and then doing multi-pass uh, calls against it at high, high rates, and they can run yeah. thousands of model scenarios to then optimize their yield of their semiconductors. Yeah. So we do this today, and uh, we're, I mean, these are, this is like, you know, incredibly important to their business because that's how they yeah. improve their entire, entire yield, which improves their margins uh, and quality. And those aren't, uh, are those, they're not huge data sets, are they? They're more, just, but they're quantitative yeah, I mean, it's like 20 or, terabytes in size, but you're, yeah, okay, you're, but you're holding not, 20 terabytes in memory. It, right, it's not right. petabytes and yeah, exabytes, yeah, yeah, it's, no, it's yeah, quantitative no, data sets yes, that are, yes, yes, that are terabytes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not, yeah. I mean, I think at some point you, you have to allow data to sit on disk because it gets so it's expensive, expensive to put yeah. it all in memory. So one of the highlights yesterday at the demo was Dr. Goodnight was on stage doing a demo. Yeah. And a couple comments jumped out at me, obviously I like to admire the, the entrepreneur yeah. companies, you know, doing this for decades. He made a comment, we're not an interpreter, we actually compile our code. Yeah. And because <laughs> he was referencing the performance. That's correct. Okay, so performance is huge. Let's riff a little bit here, put you on the spot. You presented yesterday, performance is huge, LLMs, you got people who will use AI, they'll yeah. build their own, they'll subscribe to models. Will all this overhead that will come out of the opportunity to make that go faster, compiling them, LLM, not compiling them, literally, yeah. you have to start putting this stuff together. Yes. Data's involved. You, yeah. just, you guys have good experience with, with data and making it high performance. Where's the uh, work need to get done on the LLM foundation models on the performance side? Is it integration? Is it mashing up models? Are we going to have a mashup culture soon? Or is it already here? Where's the, the pressure point? What's the constraints? Not besides power and chip, yeah. like at, at, the, at the software layer, well, where's the work? Let, let's talk about post-model training, right, in, into the scoring side, right, which yeah. we used to call it scoring, but I think one of the big things at LMs is, is the uh, latency, right? I mean, we've, customers want to put these things into scenarios where there has to be sub-second latency, right, or, or, you know, or maybe a second latent, latency. And um, that, if you can't approach those responses on that, it's, it takes it out of the entire possibility of being used uh, for, yeah, for it's a workflow. It's not adequate, it's not inside, not inside the, the decision window. And you heard, um, you know, with some of the work we did with Georgia Pacific, they had like, you know, half a second latency to make yeah. decisions on these things. So I, I think that there's just latency is a concern. And then there's, when you think of latency, um, because the, la the latency is due to a couple of reasons. These RAG architectures, while cool, it's just a lot of orchestration across, okay, I'm going to ask an LLM a question. Before I do that, I'm going to go at, query my internal knowledge into a vector <laughs> data store, and that's been, you know, uh, that's been basically chunked out, right? So they got to do this massive uh, similarity search, bring that data back, present it back to the LLM, and say, here's a few shot examples, now reason over this. And then, by the way, I need to call an enterprise system over here to go get some real numbers, because LMs can't deal with that well. <laughs> Let's pull that stuff back in and put it in there and then present the result back. So there's a huge opportunity for that, the, the performance of that, that orchestration, yeah. 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 you know? That sounds like an operating system to me. Yeah. You're linking, you're scheduling, you're loading. That's you're, a great point. I mean, you're basically runtime, because yeah. generative AI yeah. is generating. Yes. It's a net Assembly. new category. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know what you're going to get yeah. until the prompt or thing happens. That's correct. So, I mean, it's a non-deterministic model, so as a result, we got we to react yeah. to it. Right. right? Are we going to have an AI operating system that's going to not look like Linux or anything else? It's going to be some other knowledge graph, neural network? I think, I think as in any technology, you know, uh, um, any transformative phase of technology, there, once the design pattern emerges, then people optimize the execution of it, right? You see that, like I said, CPU, how do we offload the CPU yeah. to do graphics work? Let's build a GPU. Right, and so you can imagine there's probably yeah. similar strategies going to emerge in RAG architectures and 
and, and all of them interactions. So you're going to see, I mean look at look even Apple, system on a chip. I mean yeah. the whole point of system on a chip is that they lowered the, you know, power, yeah. well, the, the, the power needs and the cooling needs because they've got everything integrated in the same silicon. And that's, that's amazing. With AI. a big shared SRAM, it is amazing. Yeah. AI is a great opportunity for your company. Uh, for the, f the last question as we wrap up, for the folks that are customers and prospects, what is AI doing for um, your company and where do you see that going? What's it going to turn SaaS into? With all that installed base, all those yeah. assets you have, you're bringing to the table, what, trans what does SaaS transform into with this, with this industry shift? I, I think, you know, for, for me, I think, People should see us as one of the most trusted companies. I mean, we uh, to deal with AI, to cut through the hype and deliver real results with AI. I mean, at the end of the day, if as you know, you guys have been to, you go to many conferences, you meet with many customers. There, all the words are being said, right? <laughs> There's only so many words we can all say. So, what does it come down to? It comes down to execution, right? Of how well do you execute, right? And how well do you perform? Yeah. How does how well does the software perform, and how well does the does the project execute for that customer? You know, and then there's the post-sale experience, which is how, what, how good is your support? I heard a customer today, two customers, two banks say, SaaS Communities is unbelievable. They said that to me directly, unsolicited. And so that's part of the experience, mm -hmm. the brand experience of SaaS. So for me, um, we are excellent with AI, and we have, some, we have the most experience in the world. We've been doing you know, neural networks in production for 25 years, we talked about that yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah. don't know that, but we've been doing it, we've been writing yeah. some of the books on these things. We're going to continue to be us, be thoughtful, cut through the hype, deliver real results, and ultimately yeah, yeah. execute flawlessly with customers. Yeah, and if you hit those marks, the revenue is just the result of that yeah. execution. That's the lagging yeah. indicator. You guys are good at like hard math and stuff like that too. <laughs> so, uh, but I got to ask, I got to ask Brian about our bet. Did you see my Twitter poll? I did. Okay, so I got to ask you about AGI. Where yeah. you stand on this? So, okay. I, John and I made a bet yesterday. Don't and, tell him and, what I did. So I won't tell you what don't I did. No, I'm not going to buy him. Don't lead the witness. And, and, um, and, and we bet dinner. Like loser buys dinner, as John said, as long as a robot makes it. Oh. <laughs> Which is funny. But anyway, <laughs> the question is in the poll when do you think we'll see machines display broadly adaptable intelligence similar to human cognition? By 2030, many decades from now, centuries from now, or never? How do you see it? Uh, I, I want to say never. I, I think this is like, it's like, as we said, there's a lot of there's a lot of power being used and compute being used just to predict the next word right now, right? And I know that the attention strategies we've got with transformers are very really powerful, but the reality is that humans draw from so many data points in their experiences in life to make a decision. And what we're really asking is for computers to help scale that. Just like your social media has been an extension of your memory bank, right? Your pictures, your friends, your networks, right? You, we can scale our network of people because I can keep in touch with them in different ways. But it, that doesn't replace the human experience. And so I, I, I believe this whole, you know, um, this movement towards like AGI is just, I, I think it's like guys, for, to what reason here? To what extent are we trying to do yeah. this here? There are a lot of problems we need to solve right now. I think there's a, it's reasons to do that to say we, can, we should pursue it but I think we should be reasonable that that's asymptotic, that I think you don't really ever get there. <laughs> you just improve the way to scale yeah. human reasoning yeah. and decision making. You're walking halfway there. So you're a human optimist, yeah. I like it. Okay, well, okay I got to ask you a follow up question then. Where are you on FSD, full self driving? Are you similar? Uh, or? I have a real problem actually with some of this. I, I actually think that, um, uh, you know, there's a whole perspective in the, in the past where you build bridges, there's like 11 people that die when you build a bridge, and people just accepted that that should happen. My issue is that where's the transparency to make sure that when people are driving on a road, that they are aware there are full self-driving vehicles on the road, like completely, right, on that. And without that, I don't think we've been um, transparent enough with, the trust with society to really make sure that could be done effectively. Because as we know, software has bugs, right? We all know that. Yeah. Anyone says that that's not a bug is ridiculous. <laughs> and when someone's loved one is killed by a, uh, an FSD, Right, car, right? They're not going to care about the stats that someone says, like, well, you know, uh, you know, full self-driving is basically, you know, 60 times, 60 percent better uh, at, at avoiding accidents. It doesn't matter when your loved one is in the, even the the small minority percentage of of people. They just they're upset that their loved one was injured or hurt. And I think that 
we have to remember that. Like, no one's going to care about the aggregate statistics when your loved one is injured. Yeah. So we really have to be careful and transparent with this type of technology. So that's, yeah, and, and, I, I like and, to ask technologists this, but that, that's really, that's a good answer, and I, I agree with it. It's not really a technical issue you have, it's more like the regulators don't know who's accountable for this right. stuff. Right, well that's they're, the thing. I mean, you're going to have lawyers packed. Yeah. I mean, the, the courtrooms will be packed with technologists over the next decade, yeah. because those are, the people are all going to be trying to figure out who's responsible yeah. and who's suing who. And Reggie Townsend and your team, he was on stage, Kara Swisher and yeah. Google AI was on there. This is, a, this is going to have to be transparent. Yeah. And, and because there's a lot of work to do. And, they, and as they pointed out, and we, and we did on the Cube yesterday, there's a lot of good work going on with AI right now. Yeah, And, yeah. It, and that's got to get done and the foundation's got to be built. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I mean, that's the work we all got to do. I mean, that's why, <laughs> that's why I said like it's, I'm, I am a human optimist because I believe that we are building AI for us. It's not the other way around, <laughs> right? I mean, we're building it for our benefit. And yeah. so we should be thinking about how we're going to use it for ultimately how we want a better yeah. society. Are you happy with the event so far? Oh, this has been unbelievable. The customers, yeah. I mean, it's packed. Yeah. The action, the the, uh, well. it's, so, it's so great. I mean, I, yeah. the, the work that my R&D team yeah. has done is incredible. The work that the events team has done is incredible. Our you know, support, Dr. Goodnight getting on stage and just yeah. still, that was so cool. still coding, <laughs> does yeah. it every day. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just the best. As like I said on my tweet, um, Shannon and your team retweeted it. You had the sizzle and the steak. And, you yeah. guys, and we were at Explore, we said, you said, yeah. this is what we're going to do. Yeah. And you guys deliver it. So, you know, when you see production workloads, that's what we said last year going yeah. into this year. That's going to be the benchmark for AI reality in the enterprise. That's right. Show me production workloads. Yeah. You guys had them on stage, so well, congratulations. Uh, we, had, we, had, we had one analyst say to us, all killer, no filler. <laughs> That's what we do. Frank, thanks Love for coming right. on. Appreciate Thank it. you. All right. All right. Appreciate thanks, it. Good to see you, Dave. Good I'm John Furrier with Dave right. Vellante. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>